Welcome back to another episode of Sweet Script Stories. I'm Eric Grubar. And I'm Tim Dietrich. And today we have a special guest, Eric Birdsall. Uh, Eric, hey. I'm just going to kick it straight to you and let you introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like Eric said, my name is Eric Birdsall. Um, I'm originally from New York, moved to Colorado about five years ago. Um, in that time, also checked out Oregon for uh, just a casual year. And then I'm back in Colorado now. Um, my hobbies are really just, you know, learning is kind of my number one. Um, I like traveling, which often brings me to different music festivals. Um, and then just kind of examining the world around me. Um, my current title is a NetSuite admin. Um, but as we're all very aware, that's kind of become a catch all for if it has to do with NetSuite, it's something I do. Um, and that's, you know, pretty much just a, a, a brief overview of who I am. All right, great. I want to dig into the learning as a hobby thing later. But uh, so maybe a little bit more about your role. Who do you work for? What sorts of projects do you work on? How are you using yeah, absolutely. NetSuite right now? Um, yeah, so I kind of have, you know, I guess my main job and then kind of a few different side gigs. Um, my, my normal 40 hour week job, I work for a company called Creative Safety Supply. Um, they're a NetSuite end user and I'm their administrator there. Um, so that takes up, you know, a lot of my time. And then on the side, I do some development work for um, just a, kind of a, a few different rotating clients, just kind of as an um, as needed basis. It kind of keeps me busy in my free time. Right. Tim. Yes. So I was going to ask you about your path to NetSuite. I noticed on your LinkedIn profile that you have a degree in psychology and sociology, and I think you have another degree as well. Um, but it's one of those interesting, like when I look at your background in terms of education, I'm kind of curious as to how you somehow ended up in the NetSuite world. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely have taken, you know, what I thought was a, an interesting path to where I am today. But I think throughout episodes of this uh, podcast, I've actually learned that it, it's it's more common than I believed. Um, so it's, you know, it's not everyone in this role isn't really coming from that uh, computer science background. But yeah, me in particular, it's, it's kind of strange, my whole degree in general. Um, I'd love to tell you that I finished high school knowing exactly what I wanted to do and what I had a passion for um, and that I had, you know, chosen psychology. But in reality, you know, I, I did a few semesters, didn't like my major, changed my major. I think I think I changed my major seven or eight times um, throughout college. Just I think I quickly figured out things I didn't want to do, but never really figured out what I wanted to do. Um, but I, I take that kind of as a, a lesson learned. Um, but eventually one day, honestly, I just said, okay, I'm, I'm pretty over college. I don't know exactly where I'm going, but I know having that degree is important to, you know, my future. Um, so I, I literally went into the advisor's office and said, here's, here's all the credits I have. How can I get a degree as fast as possible? Um, and I don't care what it's in. And that was pretty much my, my, my path of college. And, you know, I'm sure many of people have a much better experience, but that was just where I was. Um, and, you know, she replied and she was like, hey, you're almost to a, a degree in psychology um, and you're almost to a degree in sociology and you could actually, you know, do a major minor and be out of here in another year. And that was kind of the best option at the time. Um, so that's what I did. Um, but then, you know, finishing that, I think, although it wasn't exactly, you know, my, my passion route, I think I learned a lot of things um, almost accidentally that really helped me on later on or helped me later on in life, just being able to communicate better, uh, talking to people, understanding why people do what they do, and how we interact with each other. I think those are all really helpful, um, even when it came to like interviews or you know, just talking to people about potential jobs or anything of that nature. Um, so yeah, although my, my background's not in computer science or, you know, engineering or, you know, software really, I think it, it has benefited me in ways that I didn't originally anticipate it would. It's interesting, like your career or college strategy is 
like I've never heard anybody do that before, but I love it. <laughs> it yeah, like I think good. there's there's a lot of pressure when you know you're coming out of high school, and uh, for me, I think I was you know 17 years old and I finished high school, and it's like, okay, you're now going to spend the next four years of your life, hopefully, you know, studying something that you're going to do for you know 30 years following that, or you know that I guess I they used to be more of the formula, right. and I think things have really changed, but. I think there's a lot of pressure in that. And um, I do remember my my dad had given me advice and that I kind of mentioned earlier. It's like college isn't really necessarily about figuring out what you want to do, but you can also figure out what you don't want to do. And I think through changing majors as many times as I did, I, it only took me, you know, a semester or two to realize, hey, this isn't actually something I'm interested in. It looked good on paper, but when I'm, you know, in here in the labs doing this, this isn't, this doesn't really get me excited in the way I'd like it to. Yeah. So what what led you to from college, what led you to eventually doing work in the NetSuite space? Yeah, so about five years ago, um, you know, I was born and raised in New York about five years ago, decided I wanted to make the move to Colorado. Um, I had a friend who lived in Grand Junction, which is, you know, the very west side of the state. Um, but I knew I wanted to be in or around the Denver area. Um, so my friend allowed me to stay uh, with her out in Grand Junction and, you know, just applied as many jobs as I could in Denver, um, which, you know, at the, at the time it was, it was actually really difficult. Um, I remember in my first week or so staying with her, I applied to over 30 jobs. Um, but I was in this like weird catch 22 where I, couldn't get, nobody was giving me any callbacks or anything um, because I, I lived four hours from where I was applying to these jobs. Um, and I guess as assumption, my assumption, because, you know, no one did really follow up, but I'm assuming it was because I lived so far away. Um, and then I was like, okay, well then I just need to move to Denver and then apply to jobs. But, you know, the, the other side of that is I couldn't rent a place in Denver because I didn't have a proof of income. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole plan, like I, I thought I had it all planned out well. I saved a good chunk of money um, in New York before I moved. And I remember I, I was calling all these different apartments in Denver and just being like, hey, I need the shortest lease you have. I can write you a check for the full amount of that lease with the security deposits. And they were just like, no, like if you don't have proof of income, we can't let you live here. And like, it was just, it was wow. so frustrating because in my mind, I'm like, if I, if I give you the money today, like, why do you need approve income but mm -hmm. you know it's everyone's got their policies and it is what it is um but so eventually i did get one follow-up um for those you know 30 plus jobs i i had applied to um and i i won't forget it was like just a, a one sentence email and it was just like we're having an open interview from whatever 10 to 2 on wednesday here's the address so um so I, I drove four hours each way to do one interview um, or in the Denver area. And it was for a warehouse position where it was just picking and packing orders. Um, and, you know, I thought the interview went all right. I didn't think it was anything great. It didn't, it wasn't like it was going to be my career for, you know, the next 20 years or anything, but it was something to get me on my feet, at least get me into Denver. And then maybe I was going to make a move after that. Um, so I eventually did get a call back from the company. Um, and luckily they were just very understanding and, you know, they, they came right out and said it. They're like, you live so far away. Like this doesn't seem like you're going to drive eight hours a day to take this warehouse position. Um, and I just told him my situation and that I was planning to move to Denver, um, as soon as I could. And again, I'm just extremely fortunate. They were, you know, very understanding and they, you know, agreed and they're like, sure, like, you know, we'll, we'll give you a letter that says well, you have a job and then you can actually find an apartment. And, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, I did find an apartment, moved to Denver um, and started that job. And that company just happens to use NetSuite um, for their, you know, overall software. And that was my kind of foot in the door to using software. It was not part of any sort of plan. It was not really where I saw any of it going, um, but it just kind of happened. And uh, a funny thing I learned 
years later, once I had a, a, a really good uh, relationship with that company, is they told me in hindsight that I was actually their third choice to fill that position. And uh, <laughs> the first two had either taken other jobs or, you know, couldn't, couldn't uh, complete it for some reason. So it's like, I don't know, as a, as a believer in fate, it was just kind of, I look back on that as like, yeah, what are, what are the chances? Like this one company that gave me a shot, I was their third, you know, their third choice for the position. It happened to work out and it's really paved the path for my entire career since then. It's amazing how one just event like that can set you on a, you know, possibly a completely different course and who knows where you would be today, you know, without oh, that yeah. opportunity. So when you were working at that position, I, you were, that was your first exposure to NetSuite was probably as a user, right? Like this, the work you were doing in the warehouse and interacting with NetSuite from that perspective, is that right? Right. Yeah. I was, um, you know, very uh, kind of low level user. Um, I was really just picking orders. So really I was taking, you know, pick tickets um, off of a printer, gathering the items and putting them on a table and saying, you know, I looked over all these items. This is what needs to go in the box. Um, so at first I wasn't even like on the computer creating an item fulfillment or marking it as picked or shipped, like none of that. Um, there was one person that all the orders went through who was kind of handling the net suite, but I was just kind of there and I was kind of close enough to it that I was like, oh, it would be interesting to learn how this worked or you know, I'm kind of curious as to the software that we do use to make this all happen. Um, so I think kind of, yeah, low, I mean, day one, I, I didn't, I don't think I even interacted with NetSuite at all, but a few months in, it was more the, the curiosity. And uh, fortunately, that company kind of saw that in me and gave me, you know, a little bit more leeway. And was like, you know, our, the person, you know, we have this person who does all of these things, they could really use some help putting in some you know, with some accounts receivable, accounts payable, like, do you think that's something that you can do? Um, so that was my first real actual interaction with NetSuite was just doing some different invoicing and uh, payments and, you know, things of that nature. Interesting. And then you went on to do some work on your own. Is that right? Is that like you were self-employed and doing NetSuite development? Yeah, right. So um, kind of further down that the road of doing a lot of um, accounts receivable and accounts payable. I just, you know, kind of got to that point where I was like, you know, what I'm doing is pretty repetitive and there seems like there should be a better way or a faster way or an automated way of doing this. Um, so I think I kind of went through a pretty natural progression of, at this point, I had never touched JavaScript. I had never, you know, my, my coding experience was limited to customizing my MySpace page in 2006, right? So like that was that was all I knew about coding um, at that time, but I think I I then um, I don't know if it was I joined like a, the Reddit NetSuite group or somehow came across I think I don't think it was yet that I had found the Slack community so likely it was through kind of just Google searching and maybe the, the NetSuite Reddit um, that I was like hey you know throwing questions up there like hey I do this thing every day can we automate this and you know the, those communities are are great in the sense that they they really help you even if they don't show you exactly how to do it they they give you the resources to figure out how to do it yourself um so you know then i started with workflows um and you know the user interface is pretty easy you start picking it up you start realizing okay if i change this that changes if i you know change this other thing that changes um so I, you know, ground level for me was workflows. Um, and so once I started doing workflows, the company I was working for was like, oh, can you, you know, here's these other 30 things we do every day. Can we use workflows to, you know, do those as well? Um, and I would say, you know, the biggest thing I'm thankful for with that initial company was that they, they weren't afraid to let me fail. And I think I, I really needed that, right? It was maybe you'll make this better, maybe you won't but right now we have to do these processes every day so if you figure out how to fix or automate three of them you're saving us time um so i made workflows and then you know just got to that point where i was like okay now i'm limited 
let's say I want to work with line items, you know, at that time workflows, you couldn't touch line items at all. There was no double joins. There's, you know, obviously a lot of limitations to workflows um, that can only really be accomplished with scripting. And I think that was kind of my, uh, where I just started wanting to learn more. Um, so at, at that point, it was just a lot of copying and pasting, you know, example code from all different websites. And um, I think it kind of, it fit with the way that I learned best, which is give me a working example and let me break it. Um, and I think that's kind of what pushed me into really wanting to learn Sweet Script more. Um, but again, I had absolutely no background with JavaScript at all. So I remember just like, you know, you see a function that somebody named add two numbers and I was just like, oh, cool. I should be able to just type in divide two numbers and that should just work. But obviously I just had no idea what I was doing. So I was constantly just throwing things at the wall and hoping some of it would work. Um, so yeah, I guess that was kind of my, my first taste of sweet script. Um, and then I, I quickly realized that I needed to learn JavaScript. So I'd say for the next year or so, every day after work, I would just go on YouTube and watch hours and hours of different videos and learning JavaScript. Um, and I think that was kind of where I started building that, I don't know, side business almost unintentionally, um, you know, learning for the job I had at the time, but then realizing that other people needed these same things or, you know, similar things. Um, and then that was, yeah, kind of where I, I started my, my side gigs of development consulting and um, I did that on the side and uh, worked for a, a third party company that, you know, gave me pretty consistent hours. Um, and yeah, that was, that was cool for a while. Um, I did that for a while, but I, my, my struggle there was every day it was a, a different client and a different goal. And I wasn't really directly interacting with those clients. I was kind of getting the interpretation of the client needs through um, like our software lead. And it sometimes wasn't so clear. Um, our software lead was also out of South Africa. So there was a, a, a big challenge of you know, I, I hit this roadblock, I need help, but it's 4 a.m. your time, so I, I can't really reach out to you right now or else, you know, they weren't around or they were you know, sleeping, obviously. Um, so although extremely helpful, you know, my software lead was very knowledgeable, extremely helpful. It was just a, a big time difference that really made that difficult. Um, and then I think I, I also longed for stability again, which is kind of how I ended up back in a, a full-time role. Yeah, I think what's interesting about that opportunity that you had was that as you started to automate things, I'm guessing, first of all, you were automating things that you were doing manually. So I think you saw like immediate benefit for your for yourself. <laughs> but then it's also, for, and I've run into this before too, it's always really a good feeling to see that the work that you're doing when you're automating some process is having hopefully a really positive impact on other people in the business or the business in general, you know, like you're making them more efficient. And by being an employee, you see it firsthand, you know, the impact you're having. Sometimes that's hard to, to see when you're not actually working for the company that you're doing that development work for. So there's, I think there's like this extra incentive and benefit of, you know, doing that kind of work. You know, you, again, you get to see the impact of it almost right away. So do you, does that kind of resonate with you? Do you think that's what you were experiencing there and maybe why you ended up eventually taking the full-time position at Creative Safety? Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, I think you, you nailed it. I mean, that was a, a large part of it was, you know, here's your task for today. And then I complete my task and, and never see or hear about that ever again like did yeah. it work could it be better like did I just save a company three minutes or did I save them 50 hours a week like it was it was it was tough to not you know and this is something we'll, we'll definitely get into later but it's like everyone has different 
values and kind of what they want. And I think, you know, what you're, what you're talking about, seeing that you're making a difference, especially like day to day, like that, that's something I highly value. And that's, that's a big return for me. So to have that disconnect between me and the, the person or, you know, people who are benefiting from what I do, that's, it kind of leaves you longing for like, did I make a difference? Like, yeah, I automated this thing. But again, like, I don't know these people, maybe, maybe they were super grateful, maybe they didn't care at all. Maybe, you know, I spent 30 hours making this sweet lit, and then they're going to try it three times and be like, no, we don't, we don't actually like this and never touch it again. Like you just, you don't know, you know, where, what comes of what you've done, which I think is, it is difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've done a pretty good job of, of burying the lead. But when we were kind of talking about bringing you on, you mentioned that, that you wanted to talk about, you know, burnout or that, that sort of transition, how, how you go from loving what you do to hating it, uh, something like that. And, and yeah, when you are disconnected from the sort of results of your work and especially the results on like the, the human side, how your work is affecting other people more than say affecting a business or something like that. Uh, if you're disconnected from those results that can really easily make you stop loving what you do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, kind of approaching burnout from the, the psychological background that I have and, you know, by no means am I a, a, a therapist or a psychologist, um, you know, and I don't, and I won't claim to be, but I just, in psychology, there's this idea of the, the social exchange theory that that pretty much says worth equals rewards minus cost. And like when you're asking your question of like, is this worth it? That's really what you're weighing is either the reward and the cost. Um, and I think that is kind of what what burnout really is. It's like that that tipping point of the scale where this is costing me more than what it's rewarding me. Um, and I think it, it's easy to let that kind of creep up on you without you realizing it. And then all of a sudden that, that scale fl flips the other way. And all of a sudden you went from, I really like my job to, I, I hate this. I don't, I absolutely don't want to do this anymore. Um, and I think it's, I think it's preventative. And I think it's something that just isn't talked about enough. And I don't think people are really keeping an eye on that, you know, worth calculation of reward versus cost until it's too late. And I think that's, you know, kind of part of what I'd like to talk about is, you know, how to, how to keep an eye on that and keep it under control because you don't, I think it's, it's similar to riding a bike. Like you don't want to wait until you're falling to the ground to then be like, oh shoot, I should have learned that I need to put my foot out to stop me from falling. Or I, I should have learned how to handle this before I was in a position where I was already feeling this. Yeah, and that that inflection point of where where the cost becomes too great is is almost never like a calm and quiet uh, inflection point. I think right. you're exactly right. Where you go from you sort you know it's it's sort of a slow transition from like you 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 love it to you know it's, it's fine like it's mostly okay and then all of a sudden it is like you need to get out right now <laughs> once yeah. you once you hit that inflection point yeah a slippery slope per se yeah it, i i agree with you guys it's one of those things that i think when it when you start to become burned out it's a, it starts off slow you don't there's no indication that it's even beginning to happen and then there's this acceleration into it and I don't know that the the exit out of burnout is always necessarily a fast journey out. Sadly, I think it's sometimes a slow process to dig yourself out of it once it's got you in its grips. And to me, that's what it feels like. It's as if something's got you, right? You're being pulled under. <laughs> it's a little bit dramatic, but maybe Quick not. Side. Yeah, exactly. So I, one of the things when you know, knowing that we were going to talk about burnout today, I kind of sat down and thought, well, what, what is it exactly? Like, what is burnout? And um, 
you know, for me, it's just generally, it's like just exhaustion. Like it usually, well, almost always when I'm feeling burned out, it's some sort of mental exhaustion, but it can also lead to, you know, emotional and physical exhaustion. It has an impact on you or on me anyway. It's just like holistic. Um, and, you know, it tends to impact not only my work, you know, especially like I, my productivity just starts to drop. Um, but then, you know, of course, especially I think because I work for myself, but I don't think this is necessarily always the case for people that, you know, but whether you're working for yourself or work for somebody else, um, when you start to get burned out, it starts to spill into other areas of your life. And I was just wondering, like, for you guys, is like, what is your definition of burnout? And is that what it feels like for you? Like, how does it impact you? And how would you describe it? I'm going to let the guest handle that first. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I think you definitely touched on it. I think I think burnout, it, it comes in many forms, right? I think um, like losing motivation or your passion to do something, I think is kind of a part of it. Um, like you talked about, like the mental fatigue, which can lead to physical fatigue, Um and I don't know, I think you can, you can even go as far as, you know, feeling depressed. Um, and I think, you know, really, again, what it, what it comes back to for me is kind of that, that question of like, is what I'm doing worth it? And I think that is just a question that you should often ask yourself. Um, and when it comes, and when it comes to weighing those rewards and costs, like rewards are so different for so many people. Some people are, you know, I love this development job because I can do it from anywhere in the world. And that's a massive reward for people or it pays well. And that's a reward for people. Um, or kind of like we were talking about, like that feeling I get when I know I built something that's now going to help, you know, a hundred people and save them so much time. And like, they're thanking me or they're grateful for it. Like that feeling is a reward for a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think burnout is when you just don't get enough of those rewards, but you're still, you know, have to put in that effort, your time, your energy, um, even, and it, it, at some point you could consider like your, your mental well-being a cost. If you do the same thing over and over, like it, it's draining after a while. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, burnout again for me is just kind of when you weigh your rewards and your cost and it just the the it's not worth it it just stops your your costs just are, are more than the rewards and you kind of start feeling that you know feeling of what i'm doing isn't worth it to me um and then like we talked about it's just kind of a, a slippery slope from there yeah yeah i think that's a a really good definition of you just that that feeling of it's not worth it just keeps mounting and growing and for me, uh, so I have definitely gone through burnout multiple times in my career, mostly in my development work. Uh, development work seems to be very good at doing that. And I find that it, for me, it manifests as first, like, frustration uh, and which then leads to anger, you know, eventually as, as it builds up where I no longer have the patience to like sit and troubleshoot something for, you know, hours at a time, or I don't, it, it gets harder and harder to push through. Like when something goes wrong, mm. uh, as soon as, you know, the more and more burned out I got, the, the sooner I would just like throw my hands up in frustration at, at a problem and and just give up and walk away for a while or, or something like that. So the, the more and more uh, burned out I got, the less tolerance I had for anything going mm -hmm. wrong, <laughs> anything at all. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, that, and then like Tim said, that starts to bleed into sort of other areas. It's not just when I, it wouldn't be just when I was writing code. It would be when I was like 
responding to client requests or not like on the phone with them or anything, but the, the reactions I would have to certain requests uh, would not be professional or um, sure. when I am, you know, just at home uh, trying to enjoy, you know, something else like just trying to enjoy my hobbies or something like the enjoyment of my hobbies would go down because my brain was still frustrated or angry at whatever happened at, at work or, or whatever it was. That, that burnout just creeps in very insidiously into a lot of other areas of your life. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I agree with you, Eric. I, it sort of, it, do, it definitely bleeds into everything. And I would say, you know, it's, it literally is everything. Like if I'm going shopping for groceries or driving or, I mean, it, you know, it yeah. just becomes oh, this yeah. all encompassing, like, you know, and it's completely, you know, misplaced uh, frustration, you know, you're taking mm -hmm. it out on other people. But, the, you know, one of the things I, in thinking about this before the, um, before doing this episode, I started to think about like, how, do, how what do I see when it, that, how do I realize that it's coming on, you know, that I'm, a, I'm yeah. reaching the point of burnout? It's about what, and, I, it's what I was about to ask too. What are the signs? So, yeah, for me, it's, I start to like dread doing the work that I do. And mm -hmm. most of the time I love what I do. So just the fact that I don't have that passion and that like, you know, I can't wait to jump out of bed in the morning and write code. Like I know something's not right. Um, that's like, for me, that's like, like definitely the biggest sign the short temperedness is how i guess that's how i would describe what we were just saying yeah that's something else too that but you know i it's def i definitely see it but sometimes i don't see that early enough you know like it's because it just again it kind of creep that part of it creeps up on me anyway but so what about you guys like how do you know it's coming or do you know it's coming well i can say you know, for me, I think one thing that uh, for anybody listening, I, I'd love for them to take away is like, again, just don't wait until it happens to try to address it. I think, you know, it's something it's good to just kind of check in with yourself and once a week or once a month and just be like, you know, what, how am I feeling? Like, am I still waking up every day with this passion to do what I'm doing? Um, and, you know, it doesn't, that's, subjective for everyone like you don't have to wake up every day jumping out of bed being like yes i get to do my job but it's like it, as soon as you start kind of crawling out of bed and you're like oh, i have to you know, I'm, you know same thing again today like i think that's just you know a time to really observe what's been going on and um, kind of ask yourself if you're starting to feel that burnout um because i i do think it's again preventable if you are you know preventative in in looking at it and just kind of making sure um, you don't get to that point of the scale where it just tips and all of a sudden it's now I hate my job. Like as soon as you start feeling that, you know, this isn't, this isn't as great as it used to be, like take a step back and just kind of examine what's going on in your life. And, you know, so many other things can be contributing to it as well. Um, you know, I, I think one, one part um, that's unfortunately very common um, in the, the NetSuite space is that, a lot of companies want you to be this jack of all trades when it comes to NetSuite, but they also need you to be a master of all of them. And I think that pressure to kind of know everything about every nook and cranny of NetSuite is tremendous. Um, and I think that can definitely lead to people getting burnout. Um, just that, you know, kind of added pressure of, you know, we hired you for A, but we also need you to do X, Y, Z. Um, and like, you should be able to do it. You're the net sweet guy. Like this is just kind of <laughs> our expectation of you now. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, kind of identifying what, what causes it and, you know, kind of checking in on a few different areas um, can help you prevent it, I suppose. Yeah. So that's something else I thought about before the episode, you know, what do I think the causes of burnout are like for me personally and the big one is always just taking on too much you know and I think that kind of feeds into what you were just saying about you know in the NetSuite space there's that expectation that if, you know 
if you're with you know air quotes around it the the netsuite guy that you know everything that you need to know in netsuite and you know everything that there is to know and which is impossible um, right. that's definitely a big one and unnecessary me, yeah definitely you know and you know, eric you've talked about that before like with some of the even you can see it sometimes in a job posting you know where it's like we want you to be a developer and an administrator you're supposed to have um, you know warehouse management uh background hr <laughs> you know oh and you need to be a cpa and you know yeah. so you've had seven careers now right right <laughs> so i mean definitely i think there's that um one of the things that happened to me this week was I got blindsided by client emergencies, which threw off my schedule. And that, you know, has happened to me. Obviously, it happens a lot. But that can often be a trigger for me to sort of set me down the slope, too, because I feel like I've lost control. You know, like, it, it's a, not only is it annoying, because those kinds of emergencies that pop up just, you know, that's the nature of them, I guess. But you know, but that's definitely a trigger. And um, I don't know, I guess I was just kind of curious as to what the other causes for, of uh, burnout are for you guys. You know, it sounds like we all kind of share that either taking on too much or maybe being assigned too much. But what, what other causes do you have? Um, I would say when whatever you're doing, whatever you're spending your time on doesn't align with what you value, what you want to be doing, what your goals are, when you can't connect those two, I think that that might not burn you out immediately, but I think that drastically increases the cost of whatever you're doing in terms of the, the equation we're talking about today. And so, um, Eric, you were talking about sort of checking in with yourself that sort of self-reflection is, I think, a critical part of this. Because if you don't do that, then you can't really know what your values are or your goals are or where you're trying to get to. And if you don't know that, how do you know how to get there or how to get back on the right track without that? And I think that's something we are maybe missing uh, a lot lately. I don't know about lately, but... We don't think we we don't think we spend enough time. Uh, I'm using we in a very grandiose term here. I don't think we spend <laughs> enough time on that self reflection or learning how to do self reflection or talking about the that sort of thing with other people with with our support community. But we're not we don't seem to be very good at that sort of thing right now. Maybe I can't even label who I'm talking about as we maybe developers maybe society at large i don't know but that is a crucial part of this you have to know where you want to go in order to get back on track yeah, yeah i think i mean you know society at large is definitely broad but i think that is very ingrained in us um i know from personal experience again like going back to those college days it was just like well it, it almost seems like most people were picking their majors based on what was going to make them money. Like that yes. was the end goal. Like, Oh, I can go into, you know, become a pharmacist because it makes good money. And if I have good money, I will then be happy. And that's kind of this, you know, faux formula that we're, we're often fed. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, to set this goalpost. And as soon as I get to that goalpost, there it is. My life is great. But like in reality, as soon as you hit that goalpost, you put another goalpost and you, you keep moving. Um, right. I remember I saw, uh, it was a, a TED talk. I think his, the name is Sean Accor. Um, and he actually, you know, studied these high school students um, who were accepted into Harvard. And he was just kind of studying uh, their happiness and like, you know, you get this letter saying you were accepted into Harvard. And it's the best day of your life. Like, this is great. Like, my, my whole life's going to be so good. And then what he was, you know, studying was two weeks after starting your first semester. Now you're comparing yourself to everyone around you. And mm -hmm. you are not happy anymore. That happiness of getting into Harvard is gone. Now you're just another fish in the sea. And like, 
not only are you not happy about it, now you're upset that you're not as good as everyone around you. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of this idea of like, oh, one day you're just going to obtain happiness and then you have it and that's never going to change like that. That right. just isn't true. And I think it's important, like you, we've been talking about, like the self-reflection, um, you know, if you tell yourself what your next goal is, if your next goal is to make X amount of money, tell yourself like, okay, now pretend today I just got that raise to that exact amount of money. Am I really going to be happy or am I going to set a new goal? Um, and I think that's just, I don't know, it, it's part of the process is understanding that happiness just doesn't happen one day and you don't, you, there's no chance of you losing it. You have to constantly check in with yourself, reflect and see where you feel you need to go to continue being happy. And I think that's just a, this again, just a kind of, yeah, a societal thing of, you know, set a goalpost and, you know, one day you'll hit that and you'll be happy and that's it. And I think that's a, it's misleading, I would say. Yeah, it's as if happily ever after doesn't really exist, right? No sooner do you reach <laughs> a certain goal, then, you know, you realize, well, now, now what? what? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, James Clear talks about this a lot in Atomic Habits and in his other writings that goals are fine, question mark, but often they present more problems because you're... Right. When you hit a goal, you, you get that. So that, yeah, when you get accepted to Harvard, obviously you are ecstatic because you have set that goal for yourself and invested a bunch of work in, in getting there. And then you hit that goal and yeah, you hit that, like there's this immediate just crash uh, after that sort of high, you just crash because, because now what? Right. Like, you know, your life didn't just, and you don't just get to stay uh, in stasis at that point. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's life no, keeps going. There's no achievement unlocked. Nobody's going to like call you and say, okay, you won. You, you, you know, you, you can sit down and just chill now. <laughs> you know, there's always and, something more. Yeah. And so, so Atomic Habits is about, uh, well, it's about a lot of things, but it's about flipping your, flipping the target from the goal to, the systems and the habits that get you towards your goals and and more more importantly than getting to your goals they get you towards the person that you want to be so rather than just setting these arbitrary finite goal posts which are again fine but you, you need more than that to sustain the sort of lifestyle you want to live with the emotional state you want to uh, maintain or hover around because nobody maintains a constant emotional state. Right. It's as if you need a big picture of who you want to be. And, and also I think be willing to change that picture, let it change in some cases over time, you know? So Again, like in preparing for this um, episode, I, I did do some, obviously I did some self-reflection. I think you can tell from the comments and questions I've been asking you guys. <laughs> but um, I had, there were two, interest, I think, interesting observations I made when I got to thinking about burnout. And it, one was that regardless of whether I'm making, you know, really good money, you know, being successful, putting air quotes around that again, um, and regardless of what projects I'm working on, you know, they can be really great, really interesting projects for really great and really interesting clients. Having those things happening doesn't necessarily prevent me from burning out. As a matter of fact, in some cases, I think it actually instigates those sort of episodes. So it was one inter I thought interesting observation that I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on. And then the second one is that, you know, I've been self-employed for the better part of 20 years, going, it's more than that now at this point. And so I've had plenty of opportunities to burn myself out and I do it at least once a year, if not twice. And usually it's in like early spring and mid to late fall. And it's just, I, I, 
I kind of think I know why I do it at those times of the year. But I was just curious about what your thoughts are on that too. Like, do you guys think that, you know, regardless of how well things are going for you in your business and or your careers, to, is that necessarily going to prevent burnout? I guess the first question. And then the second one is, do you see patterns as well? Like, is there certain times of the year or certain things that happen that just sort of set you off? Or am I alone in that? Well, Eric, I, you want to speak on that? Sure, I can. Um, I, d I would definitely not times of year that, that I have noticed. But for me, again, it's it's really important for me that my work, the thing I am spending, you know, investing so much of my time in it's important that that is meaningful and impactful on other people so that's you know a huge core value of mine it has nothing to do with money and so that is irrelevant the amount of money i'm making is is irrelevant in terms of the cost of something that i'm doing um so the the patterns I notice again are when I start to get really thin skin. Uh, I know that I know that yeah. something is going wrong. Um, my patience is the first thing to start waning. <laughs> um, but the the other thing is when I start when I am you know working and making progress towards you know, the type of person I want to be or the type of business I want to run. When things come up that interrupt that and, and pull me off of schedule or I don't, off of schedule is not necessarily like I'm not talking about calendar necessarily. I'm more talking about being pulled off, pulled off of my routine and detracted from that progress towards something mm -hmm. that feels less impactful that's extremely frustrating and that if that happens too often that frustration builds and quickly turns to anger and burnout because again i feel like i'm being less impactful so what i'm doing feels costlier or not rewarding enough whichever way you want to look at it it has lower worth total worth yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, especially that the, the last thing you said there, Eric, is just, you know, um, you're working on this this huge project that's going to have a major impact. And then all of a sudden you get this task of, hey, can you add a checkbox to this form? And you're just kind of, you're taken out of your, like, I don't know, kind of your, your flow, if mm -hmm. you will, um, to kind of work on something that you don't necessarily see a major impact coming from. I think that is, you know, definitely frustrating. Um, to, kind of, to kind of answer uh, Tim's question, um, I think, you know, when you, you talk about, you know, whether or not success has to, you know, impacts your burnout, um, I don't, I'd almost say that for me, kind of more success has actually caused me to burn out more. Um, I would say, like when I when I first started you know, learning JavaScript and learning scripting, it, I was making huge strides. Like, you know, as soon as you figure out, you know, how JSON works, like this just unlocks so many possibilities. And it's just like, you know, you're putting in a few hours and you're getting back this massive reward of, oh, now I, now this clicked right now. Now I understand why this is dot notation. And, you know, I, I understand why all these things exist, but I, I almost feel like once you, specialize at it once you are doing this all the time like for me um i'm sure you can kind of tell with the conversation we're having like that learning that intrinsic reward is extremely valuable to me so like that aha moment where I, oh I, I get this now like that's that's way more meaningful than you know money being thrown at me mm. so i think once you start to specialize like it's almost like the, this curve of at the beginning, you're learning so much, learning so much. And then like, okay, now I know a lot of this. So there's almost less room that you're learning and it's more just kind of 
now you're taking your knowledge and applying it, which is, you know, great in and of itself. But I think for me, I really, really like that learning part. So I, I think kind of as you start to be more successful, you almost kind of give up that, that feeling that you get when you, you know, that aha moment of figuring something out, because now it's like, it becomes second nature. Like I, I now can, you know, a lot of times I'm writing code without even looking at the documentation um, that, you know, not in a, I don't know, that, that kind of sounded <laughs> too modest um, <laughs> or, or didn't sound modest enough, I suppose. Um, but it's just like, I don't know, I, I enjoyed that. I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to figure it out. I enjoyed that part. And I think the better you get at something, you kind of, you learn that or you, you kind of give up that part, um, I guess is all I'm trying to say. So I think, I think some of, um, you know, that, that burnout only come kind of comes from running in place. Um, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I consider learning one of my hobbies. So when I don't get to learn, that's, you know, it, it's less fun. It's not something, it becomes less enjoyable, right? Just doing something you know how to do isn't always really enjoyable. And I think that's, that's something personally for me is I just, I really love that learning part. So I think, yeah, once you become successful and once you gain all this knowledge, you, you, you learn that or you, you start to lose that. And I think that that can lead to getting burned out, feel like you're doing the same thing day in and day out. And, oh, it's just another sweet lid. Oh, it's just another, you know, few custom forms. And yeah, I've done this before and I'll, I'll do it again. Um, so I think burnout can definitely come from that feeling of running in place, I suppose. Yeah, I want to, I'm really glad you phrased uh, this the way you did, but you mentioned like you place a high intrinsic value on learning. And that, I think that right there, uh, aligning in your work with your, with things you place a high intrinsic value on is critical in staving off burnout. Money being thrown at you for whatever it is, is external validation. And that's great. We love external validation. We put a huge emphasis on it. Uh, that's why social media is so big, right? Or mm -hmm. that's why, you know, when you, when you do finally get into Harvard, you're super excited and you're surrounded by all these amazing people that also got into Harvard. And so that feels really great because there's all this external validation. But right. if that doesn't align with what you actually value and what you actually want, intrinsic value is maybe less, it's a lot less flashy. <laughs> it's a lot less of a, uh, it has, uh, it's, it has a little, maybe like a lower magnitude of, of impact, but it has a more sustained impact on your mindset. Whereas that external validation you know, the peak of that emotion feels way better or that situation rather, but it falls off even faster and it crashes way lower than if you're doing something that is intrinsically valuable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that's, it, it's something that I've talked about a lot um, with my girlfriend. It's just you, it, it, money isn't everything. And though, you know, it, it's often said to be that, um, I, I just don't firmly believe that. And, you know, we've talked like right now, like with the development, there's, there's money to be made and things are nice. And, you know, I wouldn't say that my life is extremely hard at all. Um, but I do know myself and I do know that there's going to be a day where I want to learn something else. And we're not talking like I, I want to go from sweet script to react or like another front end, like maybe I want to learn how to paint. Maybe I want to learn how to weld. Like mm -hmm. there's going to be a day that I want to do something completely different. And it's likely going to have a, a pretty significant impact on my financial standing. But I think we've, we, you know, my girlfriend and I have come to that understanding that uh, it's, that's, it's really tough to measure kind of that you know like everyone can look at their bank account and decide like and see how much money you have and say like here's a number mm -hmm. that represents how much money i have but it's really difficult there's no 
there's no place, there's no app on your phone that you can look and be like, am I happy, right? There's no hard number for, am I happy? Am I getting the most out of my life? Am I enjoying the time that I have here? Um, so I think it's, it's more difficult to try to really, you know, it's, it's so easy to compare hard numbers, but like happiness is just not something that you can really put a number on and then like, compare that but unless you are checking in and again that just kind of yeah, exactly goes back to the self-reflection like mm-hmm. i don't know once a month pick a number one through a hundred and say how happy you are and, and look at that every month and realize oh yeah like this is slowly going like slowly decreasing like what what else is happening that could be leading to this decrease mm-hmm. so I, I don't know it just kind of all comes back to self-reflection is extremely important um yeah. And I just think, again, it's just your bank account. It's hard numbers Like you can look at a number and you can know yeah. where you stand financially, but you really should be creating your own system of happiness and a, a ranking system, if you will, to, you know, also check that out. Every, every time you look at your bank account, think like, am I also happy? Like it, it, they, they aren't a hundred percent, you know, correlated. And I think it's important to look at you know, more than just that financial number. Right. They may not be correlated at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's as if we need a, the happiness equivalent of a credit score that is a very right. personal calculation, right? Like, and one that changes too, you know, like what makes you happy right now? You know, it might be a week from now that you're suddenly not, you know, I'm sorry, but no, this isn't good enough. You know, it, it's, you know, your requirements for happiness have changed. Hopefully not that quickly, but hey, you never know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so your um, suggestion or, you, you, you know, you talked about learning is important to you. And I think, um, you know, Eric and I have talked about that before that, like, if you're going to have a career in, I would say, in software development, but in tech in general, you should prepare yourself to always be learning. Like, that's you know, almost a requirement of making it in this industry and surviving. But, um, but it's a good segue into something else that I got to thinking about, which is what things can I do to prevent myself from burning out? Some of them I'm doing and some of them I'm not. Um, but one of them actually, I have it written down here, is setting aside time to experiment. And by that, I basically mean, you know, scratching those itches that you have or, you know, the curiosities that you have. How does this work? You know, and is it, it doesn't have to be necessarily related. It could be something completely different. It might not even be technology related, you know. Um, but I think it's really important to do that, right? You've got to set aside time for yourself to kind of explore those things that interest you. And if they happen to be, you know, something that's going to make your job better, well, so be it. But it's not, not a requirement. But I'm wondering from the two of you, are there things that you do whether you realize that, that you're doing it specifically to prevent burnout or that in hindsight, you know, you're like, Hey, maybe that actually helps, you know, what things do you do, if anything, to prevent it? Um, yeah. So for me, I know I am very intentional about how much time I spend in front of screens. Um, and I have to be because I, I've caught myself you know, I, I wake up, I do an eight hour work day, um, have some dinner, then I'm watching an episode of TV with my girlfriend. And then, you know, then I'm watching two hours of react tutorials on YouTube before I go to bed. And all of a sudden, you know, I've, I've been in front of a screen for 12 hours. And that's, I think, something that can lead to burnout happening way, way quicker. Um, so I, I've become very intentional um, in kind of planning my time. Like if I don't have to be in front of a computer, what, you know, what can I do that doesn't put me then back in front of another screen? Um, Which is why I was um, so excited about this podcast in the first place, because even the idea of being able to hear people talk about, you know, things I'm interested in without me having to be in front of a screen is massive. Um, Because I think there is just you know, there's unlimited resources out there, but because of the software development, because of this career path, a lot of learning comes from being in front of a screen, or at least, you know, it has for me. So it's like, 
again, I, I do my eight hour work day. And then if I want to spend more time learning or, you know, kind of honing my craft, I'm right back in front of a screen for another few hours to do that. Um, so I think, you know, this podcast has been great to, you know, just throw on headphones and listen to it without having to stare at a screen or, you know, do it while I'm outside or while I'm walking the dogs, um, things of that nature. And then also just, you know, there's been you know, so many mentions of different audiobooks, even just on this podcast um, that I've picked up between like, you know, the, the Pragmatic Programmer um, and many other books that you guys have obviously talked about, uh, Atomic Habits and, you know, of the like. So I think, you know, for me, it's, I've really put, I've really been intentional about how much time I spend in front of screens and kind of also wanting to do something completely different than what I do for eight hours a day. Um, and that's kind of my, my second counter to burnout is, you know, a lot of what I do and, you know, a lot of what I like to do revolves around software, revolves around computers. Um, but like Tim mentioned, like you gotta, you gotta scratch that itch of, you know, what are, what are these other things I'm interested in that aren't necessarily on a computer? Um, and I think sometimes it's hard to get into those things because the, you know, anything you can do on a computer, watch videos about on YouTube, like there's just such a low barrier to starting that. Like I'm watching one video and YouTube says, hey, you should also check out this video on how to learn this thing. And all of a sudden you're, you're watching that. But it's those other hobbies. Um, you know, art is kind of one thing that I enjoy doing. Um, but I had to actually go to a store and pick out art supply and like that. It, it felt like this oddly tall barrier to just kind of get away from my computer screen. Um, but once I did it, it was like, it's so helpful to have something that's really contrasting with what I do for most of my day, every day. Um, I think that's been really important to helping me kind of prevent that burnout is just having something way different and not software related to just kind of dive into and um and also just not being afraid to be bad at something like you're never going to be good at something if you don't start off by being bad at it so just go be bad at it and be bad at it often until you figure it out and you know start to get better and I think that's just kind of another important thing to touch on that's something that I always struggle with is if I start a brand new hobby and I'm not instantly good at it I give up and I think that's something that I've learned to kind of, you know, fight more and, you know, just understand that a lot, a lot of things in life, you don't just naturally, you're not naturally good at, and you need to put in the effort and, you know, really build on that to, to keep yourself occupied and keep moving forward and whatever that is. Why do you think we do that? Why do we... Why do we have such expectations to be so like to just the first time we try something brand new, we're supposed to be expert. Um, this is actually something I've thought about a lot. I think um, I'm going to, you know, say things broadly that maybe shouldn't be, but I think <laughs> a lot of times as kids, like we're, told that we're wow you're really athletic or wow you're really smart or you're xyz but there's not enough focus on you're a really hard worker and that's why you got good grades that's why you did so well at on your baseball team or you know whatever it is so i think there's a lot of it's just the framing that i think kids are taught I, I don't know if the, my wording's going to be great, but we're just kind of taught like that we're, oh, wow, you're really smart. Like you were just born with this. Yeah, like you you're just are this. smart. You just are this, right? It's, but we're not, we don't focus enough on telling kids and even myself as an adult, like, it, no, you're, you got good grades, not because you just are smart. You weren't just born this way. It's because you put in the effort, you worked hard. And like, I think that's something that there's this big disconnect because, yeah, then you're, you know, 30 something years old and you try to pick up this brand new thing and you're not just great at it. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm not just athletic and then amazing at every sport. Like you have to actually put in effort to become good at these, you know, other things. Um, 
yeah, so I think there's just not enough focus on, you know, you're a hard worker and that's why you're successful or, you know, get the good grades or are intelligent or, you know, whatever it is. And there's too much of this. It's like, oh, you are born smart. You are born skilled. You are born athletic. So I think that's, you know, it's important to kind of separate those two. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, it's funny that you asked because it is something that I've, I've thought about a lot. Um, and I just, I think that's one of my biggest flaws is just giving up too easy if I'm not instantly good at things. But I do think that I'm not alone in that. Um, and I think, you know, if you're good at something day one, you're like, wow, this is great. And if you're not like that feeling of not being good, isn't a comfortable one. Um, but, you know, as you guys know, that feeling of not being good is what leads to that even greater feeling of finally mastering that thing. And, you know, that again, intrinsic reward of being like, aha, I did it. I get it. I understand this, or, you know, I got to this point now. Um, and it's a good, you know, marker to compare yourself against and look back on day one and be like, wow, day one, I tried this. I mean, I couldn't do any of this. And now I'm fluent in this or, you know, whatever the case may be. That's, that's a great point yeah i totally agree and that kind of brings me back around like when i was thinking about things that i, I do with whether intentionally or not to try to prevent burnout one of those things is journaling you know where i'm actually it's almost like i'm having a therapy session with myself when i do that um, but i think that if you if you are trying to achieve some goal get better at something or whatever and you're kind of writing about it you know just for your own private, you know, you know, thoughts, you know, consumption of it later or whatever. When you look back at the, at, at where you were, and I do this occasionally, like I'll go back a couple of years and see like, what was I doing like two years ago? Like what struggles did I have? Sometimes it's really enlightening and sometimes it'll be, you know, like, okay, here's where I'm at right now. And I want to achieve this, you know, within a year. And when you look back at it and you realize that you had accomplished that goal, but you didn't even realize you did, it's, it's interesting. It's almost like it just, I, I don't know. But I think that, that, that journaling is one way um, you know, to kind of prevent burnout and to identify behaviors and patterns and things like that. Like when I look back, I can definitely see like where I was either headed towards burnout, in it, <laughs> coming out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's definitely something that can be really helpful uh, for a lot of reasons. So, um, so that, that's one of the things I do. And then another one is, we do, and I don't think we talked about this at all, but doing something physical. You know, we sit in front of computers all day long. Um, I try to walk every day, whether it's outside or on a treadmill or whatever. And man, does that make a difference, especially if I get to go outside and just take in fresh air hopefully the sun's out <laughs> not necessarily all the time but right you know so are there other things like that that you guys do that you think you know help you with with burnout or anything you'd recommend i also journal i think it's another it's a good mechanism of self-reflection okay and um when i journal i i do it every day and it's like at most a paragraph it's not i'm not spending hours you know journaling it's something i do for five minutes while my wife's putting my son to bed and what i do is i i'm never gonna publish it <laughs> uh, i write it i actually write it to my son but for myself to sort of externalize what i'm thinking and what i'm feeling uh i'm never gonna give it to him either <laughs> i don't want him to read it <laughs> but sure. the point is that i'm sort of externalizing my feelings and not making them about me as much um and i think that more important than the mechanism of or the medium rather of journaling is externalizing your your feelings and what you're going through so whether that is uh journaling or talking to someone about it or um, writing a you know fictional short story about it or it somehow 
getting it out of your brain into the world, not necessarily in public, but uh, just getting it out of your brain so that you're not the only one wrestling with it. Or so that when we externalize something like that, our brain is really good at like letting go of it. <laughs> uh, that's why yeah. like a lot of productivity systems are mostly just write it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because your yeah. brain, once you externalize something like that, your brain is really good at, at sort of dropping the emotional attachment to it or dropping the, the baggage or s at least some of it, some of that. It helps you lighten that load on your mind. Um, so I, yeah, when I journal, I do it in a separate physical space. It's a very tiny storage room <laughs> with a, where I put a little desk. All of my art supplies are there. I have my, obviously my pens and my journal are in there. And one book that is not business related or anything like that. It's, it's either fictional or it's historical or something like that. It's not business related. And my phone is not allowed in there. No, no screens are allowed in there. There's not even an outlet in there. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's where I go to disconnect. And again, I'm spending five, five minutes in there writing, five minutes in there reading. That's it. And it's just, but it's a nice little disconnect um, where I go to externalize my feelings i suppose if i really wanted to i could just start yelling in there <laughs> <laughs> i think i gave you that trick the other day when we were talking on slack and oh, yeah. you were frustrated about something and i said you know just go out get in your car roll the windows up <laughs> and just scream at the top screaming. of your lungs <laughs> i think that is some form of therapy um i know it's worked for me before <laughs> yeah. so yeah just make sure your neighbors aren't too close in don't think you're losing your mind um you know otherwise it can completely backfire on you <laughs> you assume they don't think that already <laughs> well, that's true <laughs> and maybe they'd be right yeah so anyway <laughs> interesting yeah i think you know you you both kind of touched on this um you know I, I think that it's not all about you know burnout's not all about your job or like the development side of things mm -hmm. like there's exercising um you know how how are you sleeping do you sleep well at night like what are you eating what what are you putting into your body um your do you journal do you meditate do you you know self-reflect i think there's you know a lot of smaller components that can lead to burnout which you know we, we definitely touched on kind of the big ones that are more uh, more glaring but it's just there's just a lot of these underlying things that can cause issues as well um so again, just kind of, yeah, looking at all of that, um, yeah, I think that, you know, they, a lot of like what Eric said, these, a lot of things are just, we're just write it down, just keep, just get it out there, put it out there, even if no one else is going to read it, um, just, yeah, get it out and just be done with it. Like, yeah. you know, your, your coworker made a comment that you didn't like, am I going to let this bother me every time we speak for the next six months, or am I just going to you know, write a, a nasty sentence about it in a journal and then never think about it again. Like, I don't know, just, yeah, yeah. get it out. And yeah. you can't let these things bother you forever. And I, I'm, I'm so guilty of that, like one little hiccup and I, I don't know, work is just like any other relationship. Like it, it takes work to enjoy your work and you have to be willing to accept that you're not just going to fall into a career that you love every day and nobody's going to bother you and nobody's going to make you upset like no it's it's a relationship like any other there's going to be good days and bad days and accepting that fact i think is a really good you know first first step forward and just realizing like there's going to be ups and downs and just you have to ride the wave and you know make sure that the the ups still are you know greater than the downs um and you know, it, it kind of just circles back to that. Is it worth it? You know, if, if your ups are greater than your downs, that's, you know, really what we're, we're talking about for the whole episode here. Yeah. I think you hit on something there that is kind of a misconception about what we do. And in some cases, I think it's why people think that doing technology work, especially being a developer is like ideal for them. And, and what I guess what I'm getting at is some people think that I'm not a people person so if, if I become a developer, all I have to do is sit in front of a computer all day and write code. And if only that were true, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a, there's a people component to that too. And 
we talked about it earlier in the episode, you know, like you mentioned the job that you had where, you know, you had to get requirements through, you know, basically your, your, your manager, sometimes it's still a project manager, whatever. Um, but sometimes you actually are interfacing directly with clients. You, there's a people component to what we do. You know, it's not like we just go on a job board and everything's just like an email gets sent, you know, write this restlet or this, you know, sweet script. And there's, there is a people component to this. And so the relationship part of it is important. You know, you need to have, you know, good communication skills, hopefully a good relationship with your clients. Um, so anybody that's out there that's thinking I want to become a developer because I don't want to have to deal with people, um, I hate to burst your bubble, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I'd almost say it's, it's like the opposite way, right? Like the, yeah. the companies that want to hire you as a developer, they don't hire you because they know 99% about development and they need you to, you know, obtain that extra one. They're hiring you because they're, they're, they don't have this knowledge. They don't have these skills. So it's like, not only are you, you know, avoiding talking to people, but you have to work with people who often don't know a lot about what you do or how things work. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have had that a hundred times where it's like you, you complete a project for someone and then they ask you for something that in their minds is similar and like, oh, you can just copy and paste your code from the last time. But in reality, it's way different. It has nothing to do, but like, I don't know, I guess I'm just getting at like, yeah, not only are you not going to be talking, are you not not going to be talking to people, you're going to have to communicate with people who often don't know a lot about your world or, you know, the, yeah, the, the realm that you're working in. Yeah, absolutely. And then one other sort of follow-up comment on that too, about just the people aspect of what we do, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about what things can we do to prevent burnout and, um, I think having a sounding board, having people that you can talk to, kind of like we're doing here. You know, Eric and I do this a lot because we have, you know, we're on Slack a lot and we're chatting about different things and it's never technology related. Very rarely have I think we ever like sent a message to each other, you know, that had to do with, hey, how do you do this or how do you do that? Um, it was, it's mostly like, how's it going? You know, how's, how's your business going? How are you feeling? You know, it's more personal and it's, it's as if we have this little mini support group between the two of us. And um, I think having somebody that you can talk to about the things that we are talking about today can really help. It's sort of the, it's, it's kind of like journaling in that you're just sort of getting it out there, but you're not just writing it down. You're actually having somebody that's listening to you. That's kind of been mostly, I think, you know, we've had similar experiences. So Eric can say to me, I've been there, you know, or he'll ask me a question that'll make me sort of stop and pause and like think about why am I frustrated right now? Like, or what can I do to get out of this situation that I've gotten myself into? And so I think if you can find someone like that, you know, do it, you know, find a friend that understands, talk to your wife. I didn't bring that up earlier, but my wife obviously has seen me go through these burnout episodes, you know, for 20 years now and sometimes she sees it early enough that she'll kind of help me realize it's about to happen and if nothing else if I get myself deep in it I think she now understands you know why it's happening so um, I think the, having the support systems in your life like that are invaluable and they're not easy to find you know I feel very fortunate that Eric and I somehow struck up this friendship um, but it has really been you know, just, it's, it's been a, a blessing and I've said it before, but Eric, thank you for all that you've done. Um, so thank you. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's interesting how it all, how things work out, I think. Um, so. And if you don't have a Tim D trick in your life or a partner or a best friend, uh, invest in a therapist, someone to, to talk to professionally. There's yeah. a little, far too much stigma around that sort of thing. Uh, it is a perfectly acceptable and normal thing for lots of people to do. And it sure. is an investment yeah. in a relationship to, again, externalize what you're going through. Yeah. And that's yet another really good segue into one other thing I wanted to bring up, which is there is... Um, 
There's a woman, her name's uh, Dr. Sherry Walling. She's actually a psychologist and she sort of specializes, I think, in what she describes as high intensity jobs, mostly around like founders of company, but uh, companies, but I think also just, you know, technology people in general, I believe. And um, she's written books about it. Her website is zenfounder.com, which we'll link to in the show notes. But she has an episode specifically, um, I think there's multiple episodes, but there's one that I came across called Back from Burnout. And she kind of talks about her own <laughs> kind of brush with burnout and the impact that it has on us, not just mentally, but physically and neurologically. And um, it's interest, an interesting um, episode. And so we'll link to that as well. But So I guess my point there is that there are resources out there that you can engage with and that understand not only what we're going through, but kind of the specifics of being a developer or, you know, being in tech and reaching the point of burnout. So again, we'll link to that in the show notes. All right. So do we, do we have anything else? No, we are quite long in this one. So we are a pretty lengthy episode, yeah. but I think that's okay. Uh, Eric, is there anything else you wanted to bring up or touch on? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe not in particular. I think, you know, just kind of to summarize what we talked today, I think if you're listening to this, I, it would be a good idea to kind of ask yourself, like, what is it about my job that I enjoy and what's going well? And I think, you know, writing those things down is a good place to start and just kind of look at that list, to, you know, once a week, once a month and say, are these things still true? And I don't know, I think, again, my, my biggest, you know, thought of, of this is that burnout is preventative, but you, you have to put in the time to, you have to look at yourself when things are going well, to make sure things don't go poorly, and you don't hit that slippery slope and, you know, kind of flip into that, I, I hate my job, I hate my life, you know, phase, no one wants to be there. So, when things are going well, look at it and write it down and then, you know, compare and, you know, look at that every, every few weeks and just, you know, notice if things start to change and, and, and um, address that as, as need be. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you agreeing to the episode and suggesting that we talk about burnout. It's something that Eric and I had, we have a huge list of ideas for episodes and, and we were planning to talk about burnout at some point. And honestly, this couldn't have come at a better time <laughs> based on the week I've had so far. Uh, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, we'll start to wrap up here. Does, who wants to go first with their their cool thing of the week? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, the thing I was going to suggest or talk about uh, is something I actually brought up back in episode five. Uh, which was our dev tools episode. And it's a program called Expand Drive. Um, I don't know, we'll link to it in the notes, but the reason I'm bringing it up right now is I'm working on a project that involves um, S3 integration. And what Expand Drive does is it lets you mount not only S3 um, buckets, but things like OneDrive and Dropbox and Google Drive and all that good stuff. Um, it, it basically lets you mount those things as if it was truly just a hard drive, physical hard drive in your computer. It kind of feels like that. Uh, it's kind of interesting because it works on Macs, Windows, and Linux. And so the reason I'm kind of bringing it up a second time is that it kind of glossed over it, I think, in that episode. But um, it sure has been very helpful for me with this project I'm working on this week. So that's my cool thing. Right. Eric, did you have something? Uh, yeah. So um, I recently, I don't know, even just the past week or so, I've been kind of nerding out on productivity, um, you know, different apps, different softwares, hardwares to kind of make my workflow uh, easier or just to kind of change it up, which I don't know, relating back to burnout. I think that's another good thing is to kind of change up your workflow every once in a while to, to kind of make things fresh again. Um, so one app that I've actually been using is, uh, is I'm a Mac user and there's an app called a better touch tool. Um, 
and it just allows you to kind of remap a lot of keyboard shortcuts um, and even like mouse gestures. Um, so it's kind of cool. Like I can hold control command and draw a certain shape with my mouse and a certain app will open or a certain web page or um, it can be a, a, a task switcher as well. So um, I've just kind of really gotten into the surface level of it, but it, it's a very powerful tool. Um, there's a good document, lots of good documentation. Um, and I actually posted in like the, the forums this morning and the um, developer of it replied within like 10 minutes. Um, so it's just got, it seems like it's got a really good community and it's, it's, it's a really interesting tool um, if you're into, you know, productivity and kind of learning different shortcuts to do certain things. I think it's, it's been a uh, really fun to dive into. Awesome. And I suppose it's my turn. I think I'm just going to have to, I don't have any like specific product or anything, but I'm going to just tack on to what we've been saying uh, through all of this, I guess. Uh, go outside. Uh, write, read something that's not a software book. Watch something that's not a software video. <laughs> Do other stuff. Uh, sort of get get allow your frontal cortex to not think about code for a while. Uh, develop habits that do not involve work, or a screen, or a keyboard, or a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good one. And you know, I I didn't get a chance to kind of list this, but that's one of the things I've been doing to try to kind of pull myself out of the tailspin I've been in this week. And I something I actually started right at the beginning of the year. I'm taking a break from reading blogs and listening to podcasts, which I see the irony in saying that because we're recording. That. <laughs> um, and honestly, even reading anything other than fiction books, like I am I am putting myself in a bubble <laughs> and I'm fine doing it for right now. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, sometimes you just need to give yourself a break create so something down to. that isn't software yeah yeah i like that yeah All so right. i think that's definitely a cool thing for sure yeah and it's free that's true <laughs> well awesome. i think that is it eric thank you so much for joining us yeah absolutely thanks for having me appreciate it of course and i suppose that is it for this episode of sweet script stories so join us next time bye bye